Hello and welcome to the Truth From The Stand Deer Hunting Podcast. I'm your host, Clint Campbell, and you're listening to episode number 28. Today, I'm joined by Rick Kiley, also known as Double Lunger. We're diving into Rick's strategies for taking monster bucks in the lesser-known deer corners of New York. So stay tuned. All right, welcome back to another episode of the Truth from the Stand Deer Hunting Podcast. I'm your host, Clint Campbell, and uh, congratulations, you've made it through another week of work and one week closer to deer season. Um, I'm sure a lot of you out there feeling the same way as, uh, as, as me, man, it's just work, just been getting throttled the past couple weeks, and it's I don't know if it's because you know I can kind of smell deer season just around the corner that makes it a little bit more difficult going into the office every day. Um, but man, just been crazy busy. Uh, I've been trying to get out to the range as much as possible. Um, did get out just yesterday and did some shooting, which was uh, which was nice. I was usually going for a couple days a week there, but the past couple weeks, two or three weeks, I've only been able to make it maybe once, twice, if I'm lucky. Um, to try to stay uh, to stay dialed in, but the good news is is that hunting season is right around the corner, and one of the big kind of um, key moments for me that kind of signifies that hunting season is nearly here is whenever the uh, licenses go on sale here in Pennsylvania. So uh, deer license uh, or license in general have uh, recently gone on sale, so I need to be picking mine up, which is just a nice kind of. Uh, a point toward uh, hunting season getting here soon, and uh, you know, and then I get to take some vacation time to uh, spend out in the woods where I, where where I really like to be. Um, haven't had a whole lot of time to get a lot of deer work in uh, lately. I have a big deer work weekend coming up here. Uh, I'll actually probably pull a few camera cards. Um, I don't have all of my cameras out quite yet. I did have just one or two out. Um, just to kind of get started, and so I'll probably pull those here here this weekend, and really kind of start diving into prepping for my fall um, for my fall planning for my food plots. Uh, as I'd mentioned before, most of my food plots this year are going to be fall plantings, as I have the one clover field that is uh, just in maintenance mode now. So there's some spraying and some mowing, but uh, this upcoming weekend we'll get some get some mowing of the. Uh, of the fields done or the areas I want to put some of the fall plantings in and uh, start spraying those that way I can, uh, you know, get prep a good seed bed, which, uh, should take just a couple weeks to get all that prepared. If I want to do it, do it really well and get it limed and fertilized and, and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, the big thing for me also this weekend is actually putting out the rest of my cameras and I'm super pumped because I think I should be getting my, my new Exodus trail cameras, uh, this week. Actually, by the time you hear this, I should already have those. So I'm super pumped to put those uh, out into the woods and, and get my hands on a my hands on a couple of those um, and uh, you know hopefully be gathering some some velvet pictures here soon and uh, also did want to make a quick mention that uh, the guys from Exodus are still uh, providing all the truth from the stand uh, listeners a 10% discount on um, any trail camera purchases uh, when you use the promo code truth at purchase so if you haven't had a chance already head over to their site uh, exodusoutdoorgear.com and uh, pick up a trail camera and use that promo code to save yourself a little cash ola and uh, with that I, I want to also make a quick mention of all the partners here that help make this podcast possible so of course Exodus Trail Cameras White Tone Institute of North America and Lone Wolf Portable Tree Stands without those guys support it'd be really hard for me to continue to do this uh, every two weeks and uh, and bring you guys the content I've been able to bring you and, and of course create the relationships I've been able to create um, with all of you guys on social media and so forth so a big thank you to all of those and with that said I think uh, let's go ahead and get to this week's White Tail Institute Food Plot tip of the week. Uh, let's face it, we're often up against the clock when it comes to getting the food plots in. I know that I am in terms of my fall plots. And so this week, John shares what kind of forage to consider for your last minute down and dirty food plots and your options for maintenance. So the first thing is to choose something that's designed for a down and dirty quick plot like that, that uh, you can plant that way and it'll still just blow and grow uh, and it'll really attract deer heart. Uh, our Imperial Whitetail No Plow does that. I, I use more of that than anything else we've got because uh, it's very simple and uh, and the deer love it. If you want No Plow to run year round, you have to plant it every spring and every fall. Uh, sometimes I do that uh, in the little uh, kind of out of the way places. Sometimes I don't, and in those cases, I'll work the seed bed up. 
uh, if I can, put the no plow in. Uh, we'll just let it run until the next fall, round up it out of there, and then plant it again. And I fertilize it in the fall, but I also fertilize it in the spring. I know I'm going to have grass and weeds come in. I just don't worry about it. I mow it if I can. Don't spray it. Just mow it. Uh, just run a mower over the top of it. Just take the top inch or two off and let it go. And then take the old no plow and the weeds and grass out with Roundup next fall uh, and then replant it. If it's in a, a way back uh, out of the woods kind of place, if it's just strictly a little honey hole kind of honey plot, I probably won't even do that. Uh, if I can't get equipment to it, the bare minimum I'll do, uh, this is for no plow or secret spot or bow stand, any of those. I'll go out there, and, uh, and the first thing I'll do is I try to run a soil test on everything. It's just that important so you know for sure uh, if soil pH is low, if it is, how low it is, and exactly what fertilizer I've got to put on. I go ahead and do that. Uh, then I get whatever lime I can out there, and if I have to, um, I'll I'll take a, a flip disc out there on an ATV uh, and work it into the soil. If I do that, I usually spray a couple of weeks uh, ahead of time with Roundup so it kills the roots and I get a better turn turn on the dirt. Um, but then I go ahead and get it planted and uh, just, just let it go and uh, start again the following fall. And that, folks, is a Whitetail Institute food plot tip of the week. If you'd like to learn which Whitetail Institute products might be right for you, head over to whitetailinstitute.com to check out their product selector tool to help you determine which forage will work best for your food plot needs. Now, let's get Double Lunger dialed in. All right, and welcome back to another episode of the Truth From The Stand Deer Hunting Podcast. I'm your host, Clint Campbell, and today I am joined by a, a what I'll call a new friend of mine. So many of you have met, heard me mention Greg Litzinger, the bow hunting fiend, on the podcast. We've kind of struck up a bit of a, of a relationship, and he kind of turned me on to a fellow who I was following on Instagram, and he was like, hey, man, he was like, you know, I think you should really talk to the, a buddy of mine, uh, 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 Rick uh, Kiley, uh, out of Long Island. He was like, this dude is hunting pressured deer uh, and New York, which isn't known, of course, you know, by, by, by most standards, by a lot of people for having, having good deer, I think, you know, uh, as in general terms. And, uh, this guy's kind of really getting it done, you know, with, with regularity. And it's someone that, that Greg kind of looks up to. And so for me, if it's a guy that Greg looks up to is good enough for me to have, uh, to have him on the show. Cause, uh, Greg is a pretty good judge of character and also a pretty good judge of deer hunter. So, um, today I am joined by Rick Kiley out of Long Island. How are you doing, brother? Excellent, Clint. I am doing very, very well, and I just want to mention to you that I am honored to have you on the show, and Mr. Litzinger, thank you very much for the honorable mentions. Oh, absolutely, man. It's, it's my uh, my pleasure to have you on. been looking forward to getting this uh getting this scheduled uh i know greg uh, speaks very highly of you and so that was you know enough for me to say hey i need to talk to this guy and and, and dig into his brain a little bit but uh if you wouldn't mind before we get started here you know kind of dive into all the all the juicy tactics and the juicy conversation if you wouldn't uh mind give us a little bit of background about yourself how you kind of started in hunting you know what you do for a living where you're from and you know uh, just kind of your background in general boy well how i started hunting is uh I'm going to say I grew up on Long Island all my life uh, in the town Middle Island I grew up in. And I'm going to say right around the age of seven or eight, I have two gentlemen that lived in my neighborhood that loved to bow hunt. And they always went up, up north, up in the mountains, New York State and the Catskills. And right around Halloween, around that time, they'd always come home. And one day, I'll never forget this, this, this picture in my mind. One day they were coming home, they're driving up the hill past my house. I'm with all my friends hanging out in the front yard playing, and there's a deer on top of the truck. And everything just went like slow motion. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> Here's an eight-year-old looking at a deer on top of the truck. I remember jumping on my BMX bike, going up to this guy Doug's house, and it's just hanging in his garage. And I'm standing in this guy's garage mesmerized. I'm like, I got I to gotta know more about this. <laughs> this is unbelievable. And that, and that's what I, where it took off. Uh when I was young, around that age, my parents split up when I was younger, and this guy Doug and this other guy Bob that lived in my neighborhood, but it was a small, close-knit neighborhood, kind of took me under their wing and uh, showed me how to shoot a bow. They bought me my first bow. I, I, I'd wake up and go to school in the morning, and there'd be a dozen arrows sitting on my front stoop. Make sure you shoot when you get home. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, and it's, it's uh, as I grow up and become older and... and you, you learn what hunting's all about. It's just not the big buck. It's just not, it's all mine. It's just not, it, it's really where you came from and who took you under their wing and took their time to, uh, to, to, to take you into their life and, and hand something down to you. 
And and I'll tell you, I, I owe it to them, and that's kind of how I started, and that was it. From that was it. I, it was unreal. I didn't want to stop. Nice. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's funny that you mentioned that because you and I were trading – some comments back and forth this past week just about our our, our kids um, shooting and kind of passing you know, yep. know you're passing that on to to your youngins and uh, you know I'm doing the same thing and you're you're 100 percent right it's um, the real important piece is kind of uh, how you're brought up in it and 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 they really you know those folks who kind of take you under their wing whether it's a dad a brother an uncle a good friend from the neighborhood or whatever. Um, it has impact beyond hunting, you know what I mean? I think, uh, we, especially when you get to spend time in the outdoors and, uh, you know, those are things I think are, uh, that you carry with you for a long time. And, uh, you know, and you always try to do right by those people and make sure that you pass it along the right things to the, to the folks you have an opportunity to. So, man, that's an awesome, that's an awesome story. When I think of all Long Island though, man, I don't think of, of hunting is, is hunting something that's, is it relatively popular there? Do you know a lot of folks Boy, in the area that, that hunt? Yeah. I mean, when I think of Long Island and New York, I mean, you know, I always think of New York City, even though I live relatively close to it. So, no, man, Clint, it, it, it's funny you say that. No matter where I go, like if I go to Florida or if I, like this year for the first time, I went to Illinois hunting ever, the first time in the Midwest. And I talk to locals in there, and they're like, where are you from? I'm like, New York. They're like, oh, the big city? Like, man, they think the Manhattan, Bronx, Brooklyn. Right. And I'm like, no, like Long Island. And they're like, why, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, did you ever hear of, like, the Hamptons? Well, we saw it on, like, TV. I'm like, well, that's, like, where I am. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but it's, it's very, it's very, uh, how could I explain it? It's very unseen. It's not very popular. And it's very, very different woods everywhere. You can be hunting from the beach. You could be hunting on a five-acre plot in someone's backyard. You could be hunting in big state public. You could be hunting in fields. You could be hunting in cornfields. It's, it's mm-hmm. actually, it's a mecca for big bucks to get big. And, mm-hmm. and and if you if you learn how to think outside the box a little bit, get permission, and hunt these state lands pressured spots. On hunters making their mistakes, you're gonna you're gonna definitely score without a doubt, and and, and obviously put your time in. Right, right. So it's interesting. I, I definitely want to definitely want to touch on that because you have a lot of different type of terrain that you're that you're hunting, you know. And so I'm, I'm imagining there's a lot of different setups. But before we get too far into that, you did mention that you took a trip to Illinois this year. How was so with that? How was your 2016 well, season, and how was that trip? My 2016 season was it was uh, it was it was actually really really good. I went to Illinois, a dream of mine, to go to the, to go to the Midwest. Oh, yeah, I've been watching all the hunting movies since I was a kid. Uh, you know, Stan Potts, Iowa, Illinois, Kansas. So it was always in my mind. I've really never been any further away from uh, of Long Island except for going to Florida for a vacation or maybe Pennsylvania. That's it. I know Maryland or, or Virginia. But I've never hunted outside New York. And let me tell you. Illinois was unbelievable. I mean, I went to Brown County, Illinois. I think that's pretty much central, southern central Illinois. And I went for eight days, and it was a self-guided hunt. I don't want to go on a hunt where someone's going to set everything up and say, here, sit here and and wait, and I'll come pick you up. I want to get there. I want to put my feet on the ground. I'm going to take a day or two. I'm going to scout. Whether I lose a day or two, I want to find a sign, find the winds, get the topography maps. I want to set up my long wall stands. And I, I sat in these stands, Clint, from sun up to sundown, and I didn't come out one day. Nice. And I passed 56 bucks. Jeez. 56 bucks, and I was letting 130s walk. <laughs> and and, and I, look, I'm going down there, and I'm paying $3,500, eight days. I drove all the way from here from my house in Ridge. And I said, either I'm coming home big or I'm coming home humble. That's it. I'm, right. not, I'm not coming home with anything. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. That's a good way to do it, man. So, yeah, I mean, I, I drove home exhausted. I'm like, oh, what do I do? <laughs> I know, right? There's, there's but, some, you know, some, coming home is the worst part, you know? <laughs> I know. I hear that. Some of those out-of-staters, man, they can definitely uh, – I mean, you always love the hunt, you know what I mean? It's You know, this yeah. show went to Ohio, and it was a great trip, and it, it was awesome. And, it, uh, you know, I got kind of – it was fortunate I tagged out pretty early in the trip, but, you know, it was – I was willing, I was ready to put in, you know, the full 10 day grind on, on some public yep. land out there. And it's just, you know, even after, you know, whatever it was, it was, you know, four days of, of hunting and then another day of kind of tearing all my stuff down. And, you know, and I was waiting for my buddies to kind of wrap up their hunt. So we weren't going to pull out. We were all together. Um, but even yeah. after that, it was like, you know, five days, I was just, 
it's a grind, man. You know, you come back, it was sun, it like you were saying, it was sun up to sun down every day. Yeah. You know, and, and, just, and, and, and you always hear these stories that these guys go out west or go on these big hunts, like you always see on TV, that uh, the last 10 minutes I shot my deer. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the guy I went with, my friend Bob, the last 10 minutes he shoots like a 160. Wow. So he texts me, I just shot a giant. I'm like, oh my gosh, we're going to be late going home. And with that, the biggest buck that I had through the whole trip comes walking out 15 yards in front of me in his crate. If right. you look on my Instagram, there's a couple of pictures, uh, videos I put up. Nice. of uh, You know, and I captured it last day in Illinois, 135-inch eight-pointer. But it was pretty neat, pretty nice. cool. And weather weather has to do with everything. Right, it yeah. was kind of warm in the beginning, and at the end, it was getting nice and frosty, and it just started picking up. Right. So aside from Illinois, like, are you hunting, you know, around – when you're in New York, I guess, let's, let's start there. Um, I'm assuming, you know, at least from what I gathered in some of our conversations and, and talking to talking to Greg and stuff, that you're hunting predominantly public land in that area. Is that is that kind of a, a true assumption? I'm actually hunting public and private pieces I have permission. I'm a, I'm a UPS driver, 23 years now. Okay. So I get – I've had routes on the east end of Long Island where there's more woods – uh, and you get to meet a lot of people and you get to, and, and around here is if you know a lot of people, you talk to them, you're a good guy, they give you permission. So I'll deliver to Mrs. Jones on Tuesday and it's like September 30th, three days before opening day. Ricky, I saw this huge buck in my backyard. I'm like, Oh, are you kidding me? <laughs> like, yeah, you can park right here. I'm like, Oh, I love you. Okay. <laughs> so, and then, then that goes into like maybe 70 or 80 acres. And that's kind of how it rolls. If, if you have permission to go in there, you got permission, but the state lands and, and the county, the big thing around here now is all the county lands. The county lands are all opening up and you get the permits and it's pretty much, you know, first come first serve in the parking spots. And those are nice big pieces of woods, but my, 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 my big thing is really after hunting season, scouting and shed hunting. That's the, that, that, that's the biggest on all, all, all the pieces I have and all state land and, and the county lands. Right. Yeah. I, I, I know in following you, it's, I see both, you know, you and Greg, it's, it's almost as though you guys were uh, separated at birth to some, sometimes I think, um, because you guys have a lot of the same kind of, a, kind of approaches. Um, you know, I see you doing a ton of scouting, you know, out in the, out in the timber, um, you know, right after the season or even, you know, into the spring and stuff like that, where you're kind of setting your plan already for the following year. And that was probably one of my biggest learning things of, I've always, I always did just a little bit of scouting whenever after the season, but um, I started having better, um, I guess better hunts, you would say, once I started kind of making it more of a priority than more of a laissez-faire, yep. if I have time approach, um, I kind of made yep. it, you know, something that I wanted to do and get out. And, um, while, while the timber is kind of fresh in my mind and fresh, what I had seen in the past year, yep. go well, back quickly thereafter and start to see, are there any puzzle pieces that I missed? And, yep. and, and how does it kind of relate to like the deer movement I see, had, had, had seen, or, or maybe sometimes didn't see, it might tell me the story of why I didn't see what I thought I was going to see. Yep. Um, yep. but I, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, I know you mentioned that you get, you know, you, you hunt public land, you have some access to some private, you know, the, the, your job is really kind of a, a, a fortuitous bounce there where you get some, um, some relationship building materials with the, with these folks naturally, um, yep. and kind of get, you know, tipped off and you maybe have a have an opportunity to get some access because you're able to build a relationship with them through, you know, through your job. Um, but can you yep. tell me a little bit about the type of areas you're hunting in, in New York? So, you know, just let's touch on a few things like the topography, the terrain, the land features, um, all those different things that you're encountering that you, you know, in your mind are kind of unique to you, New York, uh, New York, or at least maybe unique to where and how you hunt. Well, where and how I hunt and unique to New York, I'm going it, to, it, there's so much different topography a mile away from each other, it, 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 it's uh, it's unreal how everything changes. You have the nastiest, thickest scrub oaks and pine barrens like you wouldn't believe that'll open up into beautiful swamps that go down into beaches. Uh, I have this one area that I've been hunting for probably 25, 30 years that's all beautiful, thick, laurely, hardwoods, rolling woods that goes up into like bluffs of the beaches. Uh... A lot, a lot, a lot of fields on the east end of Long Island. <clears throat> a lot of creek bottoms. I, I'm going to say most of the topography here is wide open scrub oak pine trees. Really, but it, it, it's just so like I was telling you before about Long Island. It's so, it's so different. 
It's just not like the rolling hills of the Catskills in New York, and it's just hardwoods and timber and a, a stand of black oaks and a stand of white oaks and a swamp. Let's go hunt the swamp. This has got briars. I, I mean, you name it, briars, cherry chokes. It's got everything in there. Any, anywhere, any kind of hunting you want to do in any kind of terrain, you got, it, 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 it's here. And it, it's, it's actually, <clears throat> like I was saying before, as you grow older and learn and look back on what you learn from your mistakes, it's like, man, I really got it all right here. And no matter where I go, I can have different, I can hunt the, on a field edge, I can hunt in a stream, mountain laurels. It's really, it's really pretty, uh, it's pretty neat, and it's like a hidden little gym. Nice. Are the are the blocks of uh, public land up that way? Are they, you know, because whenever you hit the Midwest, I guess I'll reference it this way. Whenever you hit the Midwest, you know, if you're in kind of southern I- or Ohio, rather, um, you know, you definitely get that rolling, almost like West Virginia kind of feel of like hill hills and mountains yeah. and, you know, yep. deep, deep river bottoms and stuff like that. And then as you kind of make your way more towards like the more northern and, you know, what I'll say maybe central, Ohio, you really start to hit that what I'll call like the true Midwest, where you kind of start to envision like the the miles upon miles of grain fields in Illinois, and where it starts to turn into like a, a lot of heavy agriculture that has you know fingers of timber and small blocks of timber where the deer are primi- primarily traveling and living and or bedding. Yep. Um, yep. So is it? Are you t- are you dealing with more bigger blocks of timber as you would kind of encounter you know whether it would be in like southern southern Ohio or. Um, you know, like the or like the big woods of like further, uh, like uh, f- further uh, in the northeast, or are you encountering some of that like fingers of timber and, and smaller blocks of timber that you're that you're hunting? There's actually not fingers of timber, but it's open. I'm going to say open green briar, nice oak timber. If you, if you, if you can actually picture this, that looks over Long Island Sound. Okay. And it comes from fields or backyards. And if you could picture this, walking through a field, and you can see a neighborhood up on the hill. Mm-hmm. And these, these, these houses are like overlooking Long Island Sound, looking at the water. Mm-hmm. And if you can, you'll come up one deer trail that's down to the mud. That these have to go in between these houses to get up to that to that bluff. And they'll use this bluff to go east and go west to cut up into other pieces that go into the middle of neighborhoods or that go into a cornfield in the middle of another neighborhood down on the bay side. It's very, in, in parts of it is big woods like that, but it's not like hundreds and hundreds of acres. I'm going to say it's more like plots of 50, 60 acres that you can get in and hunt, but you, it, it's not huge, giant woods where you, you'll always see a road. Mm-hmm. Long Island is relatively small to the, big, to, to the Midwest. Right. But in pieces, if you can piece it right, and you can get up to where all these big bucks are, and, and where, especially where they're running during the rut, and you get on one of these runs for these deer to get that wind in their face just to check the beds instead of going in and checking them and wasting their energy, you're you're going to be in for a hunt of your lifetime. So what you, ain't ty- getting out of, you ain't getting out of your stand until dark. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what type of... So what type of areas when you said you get into these areas where you're where you're finding these where these big bucks are running and stuff? So do you have kind of like a in your experiences, you know, the years that you you've put into the timber in in the area, have you found some kind of areas and and I'm not saying necessarily, you know, GPS coordinates that we're looking for here, but yeah. uh, don't want to blow up your spots. <laughs> um, but can you talk about are there any features or things that are kind of distinct that you've that you've picked up on over the years that you can kind of say, Hey, this is an area that, that bucks in this area or in long Island are going to typically use. Is it a certain elevation that they're using at a certain time well, of year? Well, or? Long Island is no elevation. It's flat. Right. It's as flat as flat's going to be. I mean, any elevation you're going to get is maybe uh 50, you know, 50 foot hills or so. Right. But what I predominantly look for, especially when I, well, first of all, like I said, word of mouth, you know, there's a giant buck running in the neighborhood. But usually when, I, when, when, I, when hunting season is over and I'm scouting, one of the biggest things that I look for, obviously, is sheds. The next biggest thing is go deep into the woods, find, find the rubs, the scrapes. Obviously, your northwest winds, your east winds, your south winds. But it, it's going to sound funny, but I look for cattails. Hmm. Swamps, that, swamps that have cattails. And this is, this is, this is like one of my... Biggest points that I've proved to myself through the years, not saying that I'm pinpointing a buck, but maybe a couple bucks or different bucks that are doing the same thing. Did, did you ever walk through the woods and find cattails just laying, like pulled out of their roots and big, long cattails just laying there, clumps? 
I can't say that I have ever have because I don't know that I've ever hunted somewhere where I had cattails. Well, it, 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 it's cattail swamps are all over Long Island, mixed in with the salt marsh, hmm. and I find these cattail clumps that are just scattered through the woods. And then I'll find a shed, and and I'll find a nice shed. Then I'll say, well, I got to really go back to this area. I found a nice buck that might be a shooter, and. Those cattails are like the biggest key thing because, first of all, his rack is going to be big enough to pull his cattails out of the, out of the swamp right. and, and get stuck onto his rack. I mean, I've seen them down the road before across people's lawns, <laughs> and I clean the cattails up, and they'd be there again the next day. I'm like, oh, my gosh, the damn thing is doing it again. And I clean the cattails up again, and, and they'd be back again. So it's 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 like like I said, Long Island is you, you got funnels that go up in between houses. I look for the funnels. Uh and, and like I said, there's different times of the year that I hunt different areas. Uh, like the beginning, of, like the beginning of hunting season, I'll, I'll take three or four days off of work before opening day. Like when they're coming out of velvet in September, mm-hmm. our opening day here is October first. I'll take four days off of work. I'll have five or six stands set for the rut and Halloween and on. Mm-hmm. And I know I'm not going to mess that woods up. I'm not going to touch it. The straps are in the trees. They're waiting. I'm going to hang my stands. I'm not going in there to Halloween. I will scavenge the woods and look for a fresh, fresh rub line or rubs that are in a concentrated area where bucks are letting each other know what's going to happen. You can, For me, if I can get on those fresh, fresh rubs, that's three or four days that I'm going to spend really getting in that area with my climber, with the wind, and it usually works for me on opening day. If you can get on a nice big rub line, those deer are just shedding their velvet and rubbing their velvet off and letting each other know who's who. Mm-hmm. It, it, usually, it usually works out, and I kind of get aggressive from there for mm-hmm. the beginning of the season, you know. So that's interesting. You mentioned, you know, at that point you start to get get aggressive. I'm interested to 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 know, you know. Well, first let me let me ask this because then I, I want to ask like how you kind of approach things, I guess. So so in terms of pressure, what type of pressure in the areas that you're hunting or are you kind of encountering? Because I know when we first kind of started talking, you had mentioned about you know having to kind of learn how to hunt around people, other people's mistakes. Yeah. And yep. kind of use that as part of your part of your game plan. Can you can you talk a little bit about the pressure that you, know, yep. you face in your area, and then how you're using that pressure to your to your advantage? There's a lot of people that are really starting to hunt on Long Island. It's starting to fill up with a lot of people. So when I scout after hunting season, I'll find the trees that are climbed. I'll find the, the the arrows that are left in the woods. I'll find where the people are. And I, I'll scout the woods so much and push the, push the deer around, I'll know exactly where they're going to go. You walk, you walk down a trail five or six times, you keep jumping deer out of the thicket, and they're like, all right, they keep going to the red maple. They keep going to the red maple. The, through the years, when I learn the woods and hunt from my mistakes, find out where the people want to go, where they only come 100 yards in off the road, when I'm a half a mile back with my GPS climbing trees, I'll drive around in the morning in the dark, in the public lands and see who's parked where and I'll know exactly where these deer are going to go because I know how I used to push them. Right. When I push them and they get, and they get spooked, they're going to run past Mrs. Jones's house, make a left up the ridge, hit the bluff, and they're going to wind up in that swamp. So I'm like, all right, all these cars are where I want them to be. They're all hunting the wind wrong. They're all walking through the deer. They're walking over the trails. I'm going to go all the way around the back door and look, it takes a long time to learn this. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you what, here comes the sun coming up, and I got a line of deer walking by me. Right. You know, and, 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 and it's proved to be, you know, as I get a little older in, in my hunting career, I really want to shoot nice bucks. I don't want to shoot a little buck, which I don't not condone that. Every, every deer you kill is a trophy to me, yeah. no matter what. Yep. No matter who you are, whether it's a button buck, a spike, a doe, my hands are out to you, and it's shaking it. It's just what I like to do for myself. I don't want to kill a young buck. Right. So that's that's interesting. It's almost like you're doing a bump and hunt, but f- earlier in the year. You know what I mean? Because there's some there's some guys th- for hunting bedding. You know they'll do do a bump and hunt where they'll they'll roll in uh, knowing that a deer is going to be bedded somewhere, and maybe they only have two days to kind of try to they got on this buck and they have two days to kill him. You know they're in an out of state hunt, so they'll roll in. You know and bump that deer out of that bed knowing that they're bumping him out, and then hang a stand right there knowing that that was probably the only time he got bothered. So he'll likely come back. So you just kind of park it in that stand and wait for him to come back. Well, that, um, that, 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 that's kind of what I don't want to do. Like what I was telling you, when I look for the rubs, I like to really, really 
find the rubs, figure out where their transition is, and just try to get to the edge. Right. The morning's a, the morning's a little different, but in the evening you sneak in and just try to get to the edge. Right. I guess the um, point. I guess what I was kind of saying is that you're kind of doing when you're doing your scouting, and if you're moving deer as you're doing your scouting, you're kind of making yes. that bump and hunt for a future exactly yeah yes. to hunt because yep. you're going. I'm seeing deer here. I'm yep. obviously bumping them as I'm doing my scouting and shed hunting and stuff like that. I'm just taking yep. note of where are they running when I'm doing that. 100% that, right. That way I know whenever I see people hunting in this area, I know where the deer are going to push to naturally, and I can be That's there. It. You got it. Hmm. That's it. That's something I've never paid a whole lot of attention to, and it's just, as you were saying it, I was like, wow. I was like, man, that is that is something that is just readily available for you just to observe if you just take yeah. a moment to observe it. You know it's almost I mean? like it. It's almost like if you walk in this piece of woods, you find enough sheds, yet you've been hunting it for 20 years, and you know exactly what these deer are going to do. And when these people come in to hunt, and they do what I did in February and March, I said, well, I know where I'm going to go. Let me get around the back end. And it, and, and, and it works. I got three or four spots like this that I'll drive around and look for people parked there hunting it wrong. And I know they're hunting it wrong because I know the wind. I know the topography. And Clint, let me tell you, it works. Think outside the box and learn and, and hunt from other hunters' mistakes. As, as, as kind of bad as it, as it sounds, you know. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a hundred percent agree. I started doing that actually with our family farm a little bit, only because we, it, it's it, it we have a nice farm to hunt, and uh, there's just, there's a handful of folks who hunt it, and you know they're not necessarily as careful to hunt it as me or maybe my one of my buddies that hunts every, hunts it every so often with me. Yeah. Um, so I had to kind of learn you know, basically what you're saying is like, how do I, how do I use where they're going to hunt to my, to my advantage? And I started doing that last year. Um, and I actually had the best sightings on that farm that I've had in probably three years. Once I started doing that, almost had had to treat it like a piece of public land to a degree. Um, you know, but, um, once I did that and changed my mindset a little bit, I started having a little bit more, I had, had much better sightings, you know, at the end of the year last year than I had, had had previously, but I want to kind of circle back and talk about the one thing you had mentioned because you were saying, you know, when you find that rub line and early in the season, you know, you'll go in with a climber and you start to get aggressive. So I just want to talk a little bit about, you know, how aggressive do you get and 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 do you get, do you kind of is are you super aggressive at the beginning of the year? You know, as they're still in their food, the bed pattern. Do you know whenever you're kind of approaching the rut, do you kind of pull back the aggressiveness, you know, a little bit until it gets toward the end of the rut? I'm just kind of curious, like. How aggressive are you in general, and are there specific times of the season that you kind of get where you get more aggressive and kind of start to throw a little bit more of the hail mary approach? Gotcha. I'm 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 going to say I don't like to use trail cameras a whole hell of a lot, but I I, I do I do use them like in little funneled areas or or, or runs coming out of swamps or far away from bedding areas with runs that I know that go to it so I don't go near the bedding area. So even if the pitcher is at 2 o'clock in the morning and it's a shooter or, or a nice buck that I like to go you know, go after, I'm not intruding his sacred area, for se. And as long as I got the intel, I know he's in the area. But I, I'm going to say for as aggressive as I get, I'm going to say the beginning of the season here on Long Island, October 1st, if I have a buck in mind and I'm going to find his rubs and I find his rubs and I know where he's betting, I'm going to be careful, but I'm going to be aggressive as getting in there. And if it doesn't work out like in two or three days and I don't see a deer I want to kill or, 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 or um, it's not working out, then I'm going to get more aggressive. But I, my big thing is I love to sneak up to the edge of betting areas that I know of, again, from scouting and finding sheds and knowing, you know, kicking deer out of there and from my past hunts from my from the from the past. I'm gonna say it's more more of a Hail Mary approach in the beginning of the season and try to get lucky. Mm-hmm. More more than everyone else being in the woods because it's opening day and mm-hmm. everyone's pushing them around. Now the deer are really not used to what's going on after like the second and third day. A lot of dead deer a lot of deer died, there's blood in the woods. So I'm going to bounce around and try to get lucky for the first three or four days. I'll take o- I'll take off of work, mm-hmm. but then come Halloween, I got almost six weeks off straight, and oh, all man. my stands like like this weekend. I'm going out. And I'm putting three more lone wolves up in these spots, all brand new areas that I found from shed hunting. I found some really nice sheds this year, and uh, I'm going to have six stands hung, 
and I will sit in these stands according to the wind come Halloween. I don't know if you want to call this aggressive or that's it. I'm 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 settling in for the you know for the big guy, and I'll <laughs> right. sit all day. I'll sit all day. Nice. So I, I mean, your 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 meaning of aggressive is jumping around and 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 maybe killing one by chance, or or sitting all day as putting time in, you know. Right. Yeah. And I was thinking, you definitely answered the question because it was more of you know how, you know, because a lot of folks will kind of, and this is I think the difference between people who are hunting. Um, you know what I'll call is just managed land or or private yep. land where there's definitely control of pressure versus yes. even if you're hunting private land where you don't have control of pressure or or public land for that matter where you know a lot of folks who have managed land or have controlled pressure they'll try to nibble at the edges of a property early in the season um, try to set themselves yep. up on a food to bed pattern um, they don't want to exactly. dive into the core of, their, of a property because you know that's typically where they're trying to keep clean for deer to kind of feel safe and, and, and bed and stuff yep. like that. And they won't really start intruding those areas until it starts to get a little closer to rut. And then as rut gets a little closer and they know they're going to start to see day, like consistent daylight movement, they'll start to kind yep. of squeeze in on those areas. But to what you're kind of explaining is when you don't have that kind of control, you just kind of have to go where the, where the, where the freshest sign or the newest in, information is and go try to get it done whenever the opportunity yeah. pre- presents itself to get it done is what I'm kind of hearing. Yep. Yep. You know. And that's, that's for me before the season starts finding those rubs means that there's more than, to me, it means that there's more than one buck and they put, they're both sitting there putting a show on for, for each other. Like, look, you know, look at my rub that, and they're setting everything up for November. Right. That's where it's all going to start from bedding to feeding transition area between houses and 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 with long island it's so it could be that could be a 150 living in an acre of woods mm-hmm. of greenbrier thicket and there'd be one huge rub on someone's front lawn and i'll stop my car my truck and i'll be like whoa whoa and i'll <laughs> see this rub <laughs> and i'll be like oh my gosh look at this thing i'm like i'm out of my mind right now and from that <laughs> rub just from that rub right there <laughs> I will I will look at that whole area and I will not go to bed until everything's unturned and I kind of figure out what's going on here. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's it's uh, October hunting's fun, but those rubs, you get a giant telephone pole rub and there's a 150, 160 living in the area. You find another one in the woods and then another one right next to a thicket. It, it could be behind a, a, a set of stores. Like, well, he's in there. That's it. I got it set up right here. <laughs> and I'll tell you, I'll tell you, Clint, Right before dark, here comes a freaking beauty walking right out, and it's on, it's on that rub line. They're, they're, they're making a mistake by making this rub line to the person that knows what they're seeing right. from where they're going to sleep to where they're going to eat, whether it's 2 in the morning, 1 in the morning. Think outside the box a little bit, like and like you just said, I'm going to jump around a little bit and play Yahtzee, and, and I'm going to catch it. Right. And some, sometimes you get lucky and it works, you know? Right. Yeah, exactly. Hey, sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. I actually just I wrote an article here not too long ago that it put on my, the, my buddies from Exodus website where it basically talked about my hunt. And, you know, it was a little bit of talking about luck. And it was kind of how I approached my hunt and how I planned it out and did all my scouting yeah. and stuff like that. And I always say, you know, luck is kind of where prepar- preparation meets opportunity. There's always just a little bit of luck involved, but it, that just meant that you were you were poised to capture the opportunity, not necessarily exactly. that it happened by chance. I agree with that 110%. But um, one thing I wanted to, uh, uh, to ask you was, you know, you know, when you, when you're finding a new piece of property, you know, and you find, you know, a new p- so, uh, sign that you really intrigues you, maybe it's that rub that you, that you notice when you're driving by, or maybe it's just a piece of land that you're like, you know what, that just, you know, looks really good. And, you know, I've never hunted that spot <clears throat> before. It's something I should maybe check out. Yep. How do you start, with a piece of land that you that you don't really have any familiarity with, like, are you starting, you know, using aerial maps, topo maps? Can you kind of walk me through, you know, if you walk into a place blind and I say, I say, Rick, I'm going to take you to this piece of public land down here in Pennsylvania to hunt for yeah. a week before you get before you ever lay boots on the ground. What are the things you're doing? I am definitely, without a doubt, going to find my perimeter on Google Earth to to, to see what's around. Uh, funnels, cut off fields, and pretty much the hill, the hill topography. If I'm going to be in Pennsylvania, if you would, and I'm going to say one, what, once I get in there, my feet are on the ground. I'm going to really, really get in there, and I'm going to be so slow and enjoy every minute of the woods that my eyes take in. Mm-hmm. 
and I'm going to look at the woods. I'm going to look at the uh, what kind of food, what kind, what kind of acorns, whether it's cherry oaks, whether it's white oaks, black oaks, red oaks, what kind of browse we're looking at. Uh, predominantly uh, runs to and from bedding. Uh, you want to find the deer's bedding. You want to find the deer's food. Uh, north, south, east, west winds, that's a big thing. But I, I'm going to say mostly when I'm getting into a, a piece for the first time like that, and I'm going to hunt it, like you said, for a week, I'm definitely going to find the to and from bedding areas and the heaviest used runs and just kind of try to read the woods almost like you're going to read the Bible or directions to putting something together. Like, listen, the deer are coming out of the swamp or, 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 or let's say this uh, – cut over CRP in Pennsylvania, they're coming down this ridge, or for say if there's rock walls, I can picture rock walls being in those kind of woods, mm -hmm. they're using this rock wall that's running them right down the edge of this other hill, that might be a good tree for a northwest wind, and there, there are a lot of white oaks, I see them digging up the white oaks, just take everything in, read it, and hunt the wind, the wind is, I mean, I, I, I know, it's, 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 if you're not hunting the wind in the woods, forget about it, you're done. Right. The wind's got to the wind's got to match up with the bedding, with the transformation runs, and and, and the food. It, it, it's it's that's that's the key to it. Right. So I'm pretty much going to take my time and really find out where I'm going to be with the wind and, and and what the deer are doing and how I can inch up to the to the edge of the bedding without intruding it, and with the wind in my favor always. Right. So and how I'm coming in and how I'm coming in. That's the big thing. Right. How yeah. I'm going to set myself up to get in that woods without walking across. All these runs are waiting. If you cross, I don't want to cross where that deer walked at all. I'd rather walk an hour the other way and come around the back door and walk straight up behind my tree, get in my tree, and everything in front of me is clean, including my wind direction. So let me ask you, like, so access, of course, is always important. You know, when people are, you know, even hunting manicured, you know, properties or managed properties and stuff like that. But can you talk yeah. a little bit of how important it is, and maybe even give us an example of where you made the mistake of not being as careful with your access as maybe you should have been. Can you talk a little bit about the access, how important it is and maybe, maybe an instance where it, it, it got fouled up and how it cost you? Oh yeah. I mean, I, I mean, all growing up as a kid, as, as, as you just walk in the woods and no matter, I didn't, I knew nothing about wind direction when I was 13 or 14. I just walk in the woods out here and there'd be deer everywhere blowing at me and, I'm like, what the heck am I doing wrong? <laughs> and like I said before, <laughs> as you mature as a hunter and you look back, I mean, and I'm sure you said this to your friends, if we knew what we knew now back then, oh, my gosh, oh, that, yeah. the house would be full of giants, you know? <laughs> there, was, there, there was one instance, uh, I'm going to say I was like 18 or 19. I, I, I was hunting with my friend Adam and Jimmy. And after I had this giant. Clint, I mean, this thing had to be 180 or better. Wow. I grunted them with my mouth. I have an old PSE Pulsar Express, still shooting fingers, aluminum, aluminum, double uh, X seventy five, autumn orange arrows, Barry Rocky Mountain three blade broadheads. I had this buck grunt with my mouth, run up this hill in, in these big Laurelly woods, and right where I walked in from this dirt road, and I didn't realize it at the time, but he's he's going to be it's going to be a fifteen yard shot. I, I'm, I'm at full draw. My pointer finger is right behind my inside of the tooth. I'm, my, my tin's right on him. And the thing takes off like it got hit with a paddle. And I mean, took off. And I'm, I'm, it's just me there, left at full draw, being like, what was that? <laughs> and, and I'm going to say, at that point, learning that mistake, not knowing which way to approach my stand, from there, right there, really started teaching me about, wow, my feet hitting the ground, and, and and it could even could be three weeks later. Their nose could smell where you walk. It, mm -hmm. It's amazing. Yeah. And and if you if you could beat a deer's nose, and come in the right way, you got him. That's 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 the ticket. That's so, one experience that always sticks out in my mind is that right there of yeah. not not approaching my stand the right way. Yeah, it's funny. It's like it's one of those things. I think even you know for me access. It's like it, it, I never feel like I have it right. You know what I mean? It's like it it always gets a little bit better, um, but yeah. every time I walk in, it's like I you know I, I I'm remembering one thing as I walk in. There was one piece of advice that I always remember and I always use, and it has helped. And that was you know never walk. Um, and this was actually I think a piece from Jeff Sturgis. Um, you know he was like whenever you find you know deer trails or whatever and you're walking to your stand, you know never walk 
parallel with a deer trail, you know, because that is yeah. the direction deer are going to be traveling. And so as if yeah. you're walking parallel with the deer trail, you have a better chance of meeting deer on that trail. Whereas if you yeah. cut it vertically and you're only crossing it at one spot, chance yeah. of you running into deer on your entrance or exit, you know, is greatly reduced because they would have to be passing that same spot at that same time as you, which is a, a lot less likely to happen. Um, and I agree with that. I have a couple stands that by the time I get to my tree, I have to cross the, the trail, but I make sure I have a, I actually have a tack so I know where to cross this trail. Mm-hmm. So if I'm at full draw and that deer finally hits my wind, he's got it already. I got yeah. the arrow through. Yep. It's done. So if I'm crossing a trail right there and I'm sitting all day, if you stop because you smell me, you're dead. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's like either you're going to get me or you're not. <laughs> right. Um, I want to ask you again, talking about playing the wind a little bit, because it's still one of those things that I struggle with. And, there, and, and I'll just be completely honest. And it's, it's probably a foolish thing. There's certain areas of our farm that when I hunt, I actually don't play the wind because I've never gotten any true consistent wind. And if Dan Enfault heard me say that, he'd probably slap the taste out of my mouth. Uh, well, <laughs> like right now, I just had, you just had me sit up on my chair. Like, oh boy, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's just one of those, it's one of those areas of the farm that like it really, it boggles my mind because I, I, I've never been able to, I've never been able to hunt it successfully. And it's always every year it's on my list of like, you know, I may or may not see a great deer up there. I may or may not see any deer up there, but I would yeah. like to hunt it at one point and hunt it right. Just so I know that I, just so I know that I can, it's almost like the man card. You know what I mean? At some point it's like, yeah. I got to figure out how to hunt it just so I kind of it, it, have conquered it. it. It's always going to be in your mind that you want to go hunt it and figure it out. Well, I have, I have spots that I set up. And I'll be totally honest with you. My downfall, Clint, is having too much. Yeah. I am all over the board. I, when, when, when hunting season starts coming, and, and I, I probably have, I'm not going to lie to you, I probably got 90 stands out here. Wow. And it's, and then this year I'm changing the whole approach. But getting back to your question, I have stands that I've set up that I'm like, that's it. This is definitely a Northwest stand. I've never hunted it before. It's going to happen right here. Look at the rubs. Look at the runs. Look at all the scrapes. Look at the pictures we had where they're crossing down the road. And I'll get in this tree an hour, two hours before light in the morning, and they'll be blowing to me in the dark. And I'll be like, what the hell are they doing coming from that way? Right. So, and then, uh, and then I'll tell, you know, I hunt with my friend Lou and Adam and, and, and Bobby and stuff, and I'll be like, yo, these deer came from the opposite way. They're blowing at me in the dark. I'm, I'm, I'm cursing. And they're like, well, hunt it again, you know, because you don't know yet. So I said, let me try it again, northwest wind. And sure enough, I'll be setting up what I think is the right wind, like in your predicament in your farm, that mm-hmm. that, that you don't know what wind yet. Sometimes you got to hunt it and fail to figure out what's going on. And, I, and listen, I agree with that, but that's how you have to learn. I yeah. mean, how many, times, how many times, I don't know if you've ever had the situation I love to shoot does. I think I shot 13, 14 does last year. Wow. But every time you shoot a deer in an area that you predominantly hunt, and, and all of a sudden it, there's like a, every deer keeps running the same way. Mm-hmm. And let's say you hit one a little bad and it went a couple hundred yards. That deer is telling you something. Right. This is where I'm, every, you shoot 30, 40 deer in, in seven, eight years. Why does it keep running down the hill to the creek to, you know, towards the Red Oak again? And then you're like, oh, my gosh, look at this down here. Right. So the answer to your question is sometimes you do have to hunt the spot just to wing it to find out what what is going on and, and try to and try to pattern them on doing something more than once the same way. Yeah. The uh, I, I end up throwing a, a, a set or two at it every year and just and, and try to continue to tweak it because there's one spot that are there's two spots actually that I really, really want to hunt. Um, one, I found a, I found a beautiful you know, I'll actually, I'll text you a picture after, after we're done okay. here to, to show you the, the buck bed that I found up there. That's just like the quintessential big buck bed that it, of all big buck beds. And nice. I want to try to, I want to try to hunt it, but it's just, I mean, I know why the buck beds there. It's, it's almost bulletproof. You know what yeah. I mean? It's, it's, it's that's at the it. top of the Ridge. Um, in the morning, the thermals are going to bust you. Um, the, yep. the, the wind typically moves up over that mountain, uh, during any part of the day. But yep. it tends to also swirl as you get toward as you get toward the top. So I've been sitting up there before where I've had the wind hit me in the back of the neck one second and then turn around and hit me in the face. You know what I mean? Yep. To where it's like and then there's a, a fresh timber cut that the neighbor did because the property line's right there. 
um, that's just thick as thieves now. And I guess why I'm so intrigued by it is because, you know, there was a few years ago, uh, three years ago now, maybe the biggest buck I've ever seen on that property. I got on camera on that, uh, on that edge where the, where the, uh, where the habitat changes from our hardwoods yep. to their, to their clear cut. Yep. And ever, ever since I saw that, I was kind of like, all right, I know there's, there's big bucks that run this mountain. And then every picture that I've gotten of all the mature deer on the farm year over year, have, or have the, all been on that line. Well, so they all come down off at an angle toward our property. And once you hit the bottom of the, of the mountain, there's a parallel mountain trail that runs. There's, there's basically three trails. There's one that once you get, like a third of the way down the mountain toward our property or further into our property, it starts yep. to slope down. Like it hits the the bottom where it's kind of running, where it's headed toward the fields. Like for, you know, it's a trail that's going from bed to food. Yep. Then there's, then there's a bench that runs about halfway up. A lot of does run that. And then there's a bench that's a little further up. And that's the, that's usually the, the, the trail that bucks are running until rut hits. And then they're down on the lower on that, that low parallel path. Cause I catch them in this one pinch point every single year. Um, yeah. But I try to catch them a little early because then once they're usually I'm getting them on camera in that pinch point on the bottom trail, usually late in the year. And it's usually uh, it's usually dark at that point. Yeah. Um, so I'm trying to figure out how do I intercept them earlier because I know they're betting further away. So I need to try yeah. to get closer to where they're betting. But every time I do, it's like I'm having to play the mountain um, and, then, uh, and then I usually get busted. You know what I mean? So. It's one of those things. It's like a Rubik's cube. It frustrates me every year, but I, you know, it's, uh, I guess I'm a glutton for punishment. I usually go back and throw a couple hunts at it and see if I can figure <laughs> it out. So, <laughs> one of these days, one of these days, you're gonna look over your shoulder and be like, "Holy Christmas, it's gonna happen!" Here yeah, he comes. I know, and I'll send you a picture of that buck bed so you can so you can take a look at it. But I want to ask you because um, one of the things I started fooling around with uh, a little bit, you know, in, in hunting the mountain, um, yeah, was and, and I don't I don't necessarily subscribe to it or or follow it I guess now so much it, it intrigued me for a little while and then I, I, I kind of tapered off but do you have any kind of uh, preference or philosophy when it comes to hunting things like the moon phases or you know certain barometric pressures and stuff like that do you have any kind of approach that it related to those two things boy the, the, the barometric pressure I can always look at the barometric pressure and the moon phase and this is, is going to sound funny to you and be like that's it. It's going to happen. Here's the blood moon that they always talked about. we got to get out there, and it'd be my worst day of hunting. <laughs> I'm like, I didn't see anything. I don't understand. The moon's up above me all day long. Right. But, I, look, I, I've tried to pay attention to it, and I, I, I've tried to, well, I, I guess I could almost say, to be honest and truthful with you, it's not, I don't have it written in stone that when the moon is at, at this area at this time, and... All I know is when it's Halloween, you better get in the woods and stay in the woods, and yeah. you're going to catch it. But the, the, moon, the moon phase to me, like you said, I paid attention to it. I got it. I had a couple books, and the, the, the blood moon, the moon phase, but I, I almost lost interest in it that I'm looking at that too much instead of being like, you know what? Let me go hunt my trees I have set up. I'm on vacation. I've been looking forward to this all year long. Let me get in, hunt the wind, and let me be surprised. Right. In, in, in instead, you know, but I, I tried it, but like you said, I lost interest in really trying to keep up with it instead of let's get out of the house, let's get everything in the truck, let's get egg sandwiches, and let's get in the woods, you know? Right. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, the first year I tried it, I I used it early in the season, and I set up on this piece of public land I'd never hunted before and saw three yep. bucks opening day. So opening day in the eastern part of PA here is uh, that year, I think it was September 19th. And so okay. I saw three bucks, and it was all – in relation to the, like what the moon told me, like when I was going to see movement. And so then oh, I was kind of like, man, start, I was like, this thing. I'm at a day. It was telling you bracket. Yeah. It was telling me, I think it was like around five o'clock or something like that. And it was saying I was going to see movement or three thirty. I forget exactly what it was, but in the, in the frame that it told me I was going to see movement, I saw movement. And yeah. so then I started kind of paying, I think to your point, I started paying a little bit too much attention to it. Um, and then, you know, I, I would also kind of use it, you know, it's, I, growing up, I was always what you were kind of talking about. I was a uh, from light to dark kind of hunter. I was out in the woods all day, you know, and that's, that's yep. that was my approach. And then yeah. I started kind of, you know, it's one of those things where sometimes you, you know, you have to kind of pick and choose what information actually works for you. I'm not saying that anyone is, is right or wrong necessarily. It's all about what works best for you, where you're hunting and your yep. hunting situation. 
And I knew a lot yep. of guys that were having success were doing morning hunts and evening hunts and really kind of were staying out of the woods in, in the afternoon and stuff. And so I kind of started taking that approach. And that's when I really started using the moon to kind of help tell me what days, evening should I be hunting? If it was a bad, bad morning, I was trying to stay out of the, off the property to keep the pressure low and stuff like that. And then, yep. and then I realized that, you know, that might work if you have really, really low pressure and you can kind of in, can control the variables. But I had a lot of other people hunting the property. So the movement of the deer wasn't necessarily always going to be predicated on the moon per se. It was part of it was going to be predicated on who was stumbling around the woods that day. Exactly. <laughs> you know, that so that, that, that was when total. I started throwing it kind of out the window, not to say that it doesn't work for some people. It just, I found that it wasn't, it wasn't leading me to, um, having sightings and then i found once i just started going back to the old school methodology i'm gonna i'm gonna find a good spot you know in a in a, in a pinch point or a place where i've seen good sign or a place yep. that i've historically had a had a an encounter or near a, a an area that i know to be a you know a doe bedding area if it's during the rut that i know that i'm probably gonna get some cruising and i started just taking that approach and throwing the moon kind of out and all of a sudden my my sightings went up and uh yep. the fun factor went up <laughs> I'm going to say that's exactly what happened to me with, you know, with, with, with the, the pressure and uh, of, of the public. That's, that, that's exactly, it's exactly what happened. Yeah. 100%. So, you know, what time of season, I know you get out kind of, kind of early, um, you know, and then I know you have six weeks off, man. I'm, I'm just going to go on record and say that I'm, I'm extremely, extremely jealous. Of, <laughs> I was going to say you're jealous, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm totally jealous. I'm totally jealous. Um, but you know what time of season? I know you're getting to hunt the season overall, of course, with that with that much time that you're able to take off. But you know, is there a part of the season that you prefer to hunt? You know, or have you found that you've had more success during you know a part uh, a specific part of the season versus you know I, other part? I am definitely going to say Halloween, kicking off the Super Bowl of whitetail hunting, right through November. I mean, even even the end of November will surprise you. Mm-hmm. That's that's got to be my. If I was going to take vacation and only be able to hunt two or three weeks, mm-hmm. it would be from Halloween on, hundred yeah. percent, definitely. Do you get in? That's do you uh, do much late season hunting? I do actually. Uh, first of all, I have the most amazing wife that is unbelievable. That is very understanding how much I love to hunt. Right. And every weekend that comes when I go back to work. She lets me hunt almost every weekend. As long as everything's done at the house, the kids are taken care of. Right. I, I hunt every weekend right to the end, whether it's one day or both days or just a morning hunt, evening hunt. And I, I'll try to, I'll, if I have a buck tag left, I'll still try to hunt and, and be picky and try to kill a good buck or, or a big medium, you know. Mm-hmm. But here on Long Island, it's unlimited doe kill. So you can, oh, wow. you can, you can shoot your two bucks and... You can shoot 15, 20 does if you want. Wow. And I got a lot of people on my, on my route that like to eat the deer. We love, we probably eat four or five deer a year. Just, you know, my my kids and my wife and me. Right. We yeah. love it. Yeah. We love venison. Yeah. You hear that? Um, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's funny because what I've found for me, <laughs> at least, has been, you know, you know, of course, that, uh, you know, kicking off there around the, the Halloween, Halloween time. Yep. Um, you know, it was all, you know, of course a, a great time to be in the timber. I've actually grown to really like, uh, late season, um, for a couple of reasons. Well, you know, of course, love hunting the, that pre-rut and, and rut phase is just, yep. is, you know, if you get into the right situation and you find, and you get some hot does or whatever, just, it goes bananas and it's just, there's nothing. Oh like yeah. It. Right um, place at the right time. Yeah. And, um, but for me, it's, you know, the, I don't hunt a lot on our family farm anymore. I hunt a lot of public land during the, you know, during early season pre-rut and rut. You know, I usually try to yep. spend the, my, my, what I call my rutcation in Ohio now. Um, yep. And then, so the family farm, I don't touch a whole lot until late season. We do put some food plots in and stuff like that. And I usually try to keep tabs on, you know, a buck or two that I've had on camera that I want to kind of go after. Um, and like I was kind of explaining it, you know, it, there, there is some pressure on it, um, you know. And so usually whenever it starts, and the, most of the folks I hunt with are, are, all, are older than I am. It's like my, my father-in-law and some of his buddies and stuff like that. So when the weather turns and gets kind of cold or it starts to get a little nasty out with some cold, you know, light misting rain and stuff like that, they're not... Once that comes yeah, into Pennsylvania, they're, they're, they're kind of done. You're in there by yourself. That's yeah. it. <laughs> so yeah. I, uh, I, I've taken to start, I really hunt the farm now, uh, late season when it comes in the day after Christmas and I'll, and you know, I have a pretty generous, you know, time off from my employer over Christmas. We get, you know, basically two weeks off right around the holiday. So 
I can yeah. hunt that pretty hard, which is nice. And I'll spend like a good four days hunting, hunting that. And I'm able to use some food sources. And that was where there, there was a, a deer I had on camera last year, early in the year. And then, uh, it was like August and I'll maybe send you a picture too of these, you know, for by, you know, Midwest standards, he's not huge, but by Pennsylvania standards, you know, in our farm, he's, he's a nice looking deer. And then yep. he just, he disappeared and then I never saw him again. And then I had a picture of him in, I want to say, what was it like October 19th? He sh- started showing up where there's this like classic, you know, uh, community, uh, scrape and he was showing yep. up, he showed up two nights in a row there. Um, yep. and then again, never saw him again until I want to say I got him on camera right after rifle season, I think, uh, right after, yeah, right after gun season went out. So he made it through the year and there was a, a late rut that was going on. I think it was like the very beginning of January and I caught him in, in a food, in a food source on a, on a camera running some does here and there. Um, yep. and so I know he's still alive. And so I went and then prior to that, you know, there around Christmas, I actually sat on this Ridge. Um, it was classic, you know, Dan, en- Dan Enfault, you know, third of the way up the ridge, you know, and he kind of moseyed his way through and he was just, he was just out of reach, but I got a on the hoof sighting of him and it's the only daylight picture or sighting that I've ever had of him in, in two years. Cause I had pictures of him as a two and a half year old the year before he was a three and a half last year and he should be a four and a half this year. And that um, was in January. Yeah. Um, and is this, it's still hunting season in Pennsylvania in January? No, no. I saw him on the hoof and, uh, I want to say it was, a, I saw him twice. I saw him the 26th and 27th. Um, gotcha. in my stand. So the one day I set up, he showed up 60 yards below me. I went back the next day. I moved my stand down and just kind of repositioned myself because I knew where he was coming in. And then yeah. for whatever reason, there's basically two ways to get to that food source. And he, it was a 50, 50 chance. And he went the other way. He went up above me and I, and I saw him on my way out. Um, yeah. and then I got him on camera in January after the, after, you know, muzzle loader and everything was over. So I know that he made it made it through but i've only but my best sightings of him were in late season and, and i so i'm pretty stoked this year i told my buddy i was like i'm killing him in october this year because i know where he's bedding and i know how he's getting to food now i was like so i think awesome. I, was, I was like i think i have his number i was like so yeah. i was like you can hold me to it i was like i'm going to kill him in october if not i was like you can cut my shirt tail off or something i don't know we'll figure something out <laughs> <laughs> well like me and my friends say you know when the rut comes you know obviously it's mother nature's way to take a buck and take him out of his core area and let him breed with different groups of deer, not in with the family. Right. So you'll have deer during the rut from, like what you're saying, the buck that's on your property that you saw late season. He's probably there in the beginning, and that's probably where his home range or where he lives. But he was probably four mountains away running after whoever he has to run after, and all of a sudden now they're all coming back home. Yeah. So late, late season for us here will... We'll, we'll we'll text message. Holy crap! The big the big you know, the big six is back with the big brows. He's back home. I'm sitting all day. I'm not leaving. Right. So that's kind of what, that's kind of what we say here is like. But the buck that disappeared, that we saw walking down the road, or we had a picture of, or you know, we had a shed, is nowhere to be seen during the rut. But come the end of the season, December around Christmas time, Thanksgiving even maybe, like boom, he just showed up at home again. He's back. You know. Yeah, and he's. So that's, he's- that's, that that sounds like that's probably what's going on with uh, with with that. You just you're, you're catching him coming back. So you're either going to get him in the beginning or you're going to get him in the late season. Yeah, and he's a cagey he's a cagey fella. He's not getting his picture taken other than at night too. So yeah. um, that was kind of what tipped me off to where he was betting because I think he's betting on the neighbor's property on a, on a creek bottom, and uh, yeah. there's a nice kind of uh, two ridges that come together that kind of funnel funnels everything up through the middle of the property and there's a food source on the left hand side and then once you get to the top of that funnel as you hit hit the mountain there's another food source on the right hand side so he's hitting one of those two so i'm gonna i'm gonna intercept him at the beginning of that pinch point where he has to make a decision where he's gonna go but i can't wait to see how this unfolds you got yeah, yeah i'll send you i'll send you a picture of him here this evening so you can get a get a get a look at him but i wanted to just ask you a couple more questions man I, it's uh, I, I know in talking to you and um and, it, and of course i know greg's approach too that you, you're both kind of old school guys and really kind of rely on woodsmanship whenever it comes <clears throat> to getting the job done in terms of the whitetail yep. woods so i'm always curious to get people's take on what their opinion is of the amount of technology that's used in in hunting today so just uh, thinking of all the things that people have at their disposal now, like what's your what's your opinion on it? Like, is it is it good? Is it bad? Do you find some of it helpful, or you know, what do you think? Boy, well, it's it, it, it's always definitely helpful to uh, use a camera and get a picture of a deer just to know that you're in the right area. Like I said, whether it's two o'clock in the morning or pictures taken three o'clock in the morning, that's helpful. Like, all right, 
the first thing you got to do is you have to be in an area where a big buckle is or that you want to kill. And now you have information that, all right, he's here. But I, I, I'm going to say my 30 years of bow hunting, that as I learn, as I grow older, it is a hell of a lot more fun to almost get in the woods, hunt the wind right, get in the right way, even if it's a piece of woods that you've never been in before. And you and your friends say, you know what, let's go hunt this woods, let's go around the back end. I'm going to go all the way over in that piece, and I'm going to take my GPS, I'm going to get over there. And it's almost like Christmas, Clint. It's, and it's like, you know what, I, I, I'm looking down this run that I'm set up on. I have no pictures, I have no sheds, I have no nothing. And here comes a beautiful brown chocolate rack buck going to be 10 yards in front of me, and I freaking smoke him. Mm -hmm. To me, to me, that is insanely at the top of the list of being a whitetail bow hunter and watching and hearing that deer tip over, and you had no idea he was ever there. Mm -hmm. And you did what you had to do to trick him and, and, and to get past his nose and to get in his world and kill him. Yeah. To have thousands of pictures of a deer and this one's going to feed him and acts like he's going to own him, and it's my deer, and it's just, to me, that's not the way I want. I don't want to know what I'm going to kill. I mean, I want to know what I'm going to kill due to my hard work. Right, yeah. Due, 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 due to my feet on the ground, being in the woods every weekend of the year, whether it's July, and, 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 and this year I really got into my GPS, learning from Greg, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, really getting back deep in the woods. I'm gonna, and, and I have a lot of sets set up this year. I got three or four sets set up that there's no tax. I have no tax. I have no nothing. I'm parking my truck. I'm turning on my GPS. And I hope this thing is right because it's got to bring me to my tree. <laughs> but it's two o'clock in the morning, and I, if I don't get to this tree, I'm screwed. <laughs> I hear that, man. I got turned around. But, yeah, <laughs> well, I, I tell you what, I, I, I did a couple dry runs with my climber, and it's going to be like a thirty, forty minute walk. But I'll tell you, Clint, it, it, it brought me right to it, and I'm like, here it is, perfect. Yeah. I mean, perfect. Yeah, I use so, the line. Uh, so, I yeah, to, your, your, your answer to technology is, as I'm growing older, I almost don't want to have a camera and have hundreds of pictures and and know what I'm going to kill. I want right. it to be a surprise, and I want it to be done the right way, you know, in the woods with my bow and arrow and right. with my time. You know right. what I mean? Yeah, I hear that, man. It's uh, Yeah. yeah I, I think for me, it's, you know, my kind of perspective on it is that, um, and this is just my own kind of personal view of it is yep. I'm a person who likes information. However, I'm a person who also probably likes information too much to where it's like I spend so much time going over the painstaking details versus just kind of trusting my gut instincts. You know what and I mean? I've and been, kind of been there and done and, that. And, and letting like the predator take over in me a little yep. bit, you know? Yep. Um, and that was the lesson I kind of learned last year. It's like, you know, I run trail cameras and, and in the past I've run them – you know, I think I relied on them too much, you know, to where I was really, yeah. I was, I was, I was getting, you know, what I call analysis paralysis where I was trying, I couldn't make a decision cause I had too much information to kind of filter through, um, yep. which was a challenge for me. Um, and then, and so I've kind of backed off and I now kind of use them with the approach of, I kind of use them in the early season and I want to see what deer I have around. I want to take an inventory basically. I might yep. have one in a in a known kind of pinch point where I know where that one deer I kind of want to go after where I think he's going to be coming through because I want to confirm you know that what my assumption is, um, yep. and then you know and then I'll, some of the cameras I'll let soak for a year and then I'll I'll go grab the the um, I'll go grab the cards at the end of the year and then I'll flip through and and then I'll use that information for next year you know because yep. the one thing that I've learned is that you know. If a good if there's a good bedding area, it's a good bedding area, and if that buck gets killed, there's another buck that's going to come behind him and use that bedding area because it was a good bedding area. I, so, I agree with that a hundred percent. It's almost like a good fishing spot with current going over a rock. You catch one fish, another fish is going to take his place. Right, and, and you know, and, and you have to play like what changes a little bit. Has food have food sources changed, and how the seasons changing, and what foods coming in and stuff like that. I mean, so there's there's that part of it that you have to play. But if you have yeah. intelligence from a previous year, and I have let my camera run for a year, and I figure out in the early season I'm seeing a lot of deer here, mid season I'm not, but then late season again. Well, it sounds like that's a good spot for me to be early and late season, and there's deer moving yep. through there. You know what I mean? So, so historically it should kind of it should bear fruit, and then you know, and the same would hold true. It's like if you have a camera that has some action, you let it soak for a whole year, and there's not a whole lot going on early or late, but during the rut it's popping off. Chances are there's there's hot does that are using that area during the rut. 
which is why you're yep, getting a right, lot of yep. a lot of action. So it's like I'm trying to do more of that to where I'm I'm laying a a, a game plan for to use that information for like I guess years to come as as like a long term yep. game plan as opposed to like a that year specifically game plan. So Boy, and, and and it's funny how you tell how you say you let your camera soak. And and you notice I mentioned this year I went to Illinois to the Midwest. Mm-hmm. And that was November 1st or 2nd I left here to drive to Illinois. And a couple of my spots I was hunting for the rut here, I put cameras on the runs going by my trees and the scrapes I was hunting over. Mm -hmm. And I left them there for when I went to Illinois just to see what was going on when I was in Illinois for 10 days. Mm -hmm. I came back to hunt, and those three cameras on those three trees, the best day to hunt was November 12th to the 15th, and each tree had a shooter on it with better than 140. Nice. Middle of the day, middle of the day, just drooling, walking by my camera. I'm like, oh my gosh. So I would say being being one of those trees between the 12th and the 14th this year, right? Yeah, but see, now here's my problem. I got all new spots this year. I'm going to be thinking about that. <laughs> <laughs> my friends are going to be like, are you kidding me? I'm like, oh, I got to go back to the cherry tree hey, man, where the I'll... camera was last year. Right, well, I'm going to go there. Or should I go here? Or should I go there? Hey, you, you, give me, you shoot me those GPS coordinates, man. I'll buy a New York license. I'll be up. Oh, man. Clint, it kills me. <laughs> My friends say every year you kill yourself because you're jumping all around. So this year, that's it. I, I, I made a, I made an etch to myself, and I'm getting made fun of already by a couple people. You, you, you're you going to hunt more than five spots. You're, you're, you're out of your mind. I'm hunting six stands, five stands, and that's it. And I'm, I'm sticking to it. I have to. Well, you gotta but it, it's, it's, I, I, I totally outthink myself, mm-hmm. like you said, because of the technology. And I know what happened last year, and I know what happens through the years. But yeah. My, my whole thing is I, I just have to stay put. I, 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 I kind of outthink everything and try to brainstorm it and make it work. It works, but I really got to work more than I should. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes you just got to shut the brain off, man. And you got to just let the instinct take over. That's for sure. You know, I guess that's one of the things that, you know, as I'm, as I'm getting older, you know, that I'm fig- that I'm figuring out, it's like, you know, these things just trust them. You know what I mean? Yep. I think a lot exactly. of times as deer hunters, we outthink ourselves a little bit and just don't trust what what's right in front of us. Um, yeah. You know, sometimes yeah. the best kept secrets are the ones that are right in front of you, though, too. You know what I mean? It's kind of, you know, yep. it's, uh, you know, I know one of the things in talking to, you know, whether it's talking to you or Greg or, you know, Dan Enfold or, you know, Curtis, you know, those honey holes a lot of times are places that are just overlooked by people because they seem like there wouldn't be deer there because, oh, man, it's too close to the road. Or it's too close yeah, to a like, parking like, lot. Like I was listening to your podcast the other night with Curtis, which is another w- w- a well-respected hunter in, in my eyes, just like Greg is, you know, from listening to him and on social media. Uh, like he mentioned the parking lot. Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, Long Island is, is, you know, these guys are going all the way back in the woods. And, and you know what? What about across the street behind the sump in this little one-acre timber let me get my camera on the edge of the road to the run that's coming out of it and get pictures of him away from where he's going and know what's going on in there. Yeah. It's sometimes if you, if you could think outside the box, a really nice buck will be, he'll be right under your chin. You won't even know it. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you two more questions, man. I'm going to get you out of here because I want to be respectful for, of, uh, of your time and your evening here, but this one's controversial. So fixed. <laughs> I'm sorry. Here right. we go. Okay. Here we Fit. go. <laughs> So fixed, you know, broadheads, yep, or mechanical broadheads. What's your what's your poison? I am going to say one hundred and ten million percent fixed blade broadheads. All right. What's uh? What's your what's your reason? I just had and heard too many bad stories of mechanicals not opening, which I know they're opening, right. or hitting the shoulder bone. But I put so much time and effort into hunting. And I love to shoot my bow like Greg, and I love tuning my bows. If I can get an arrow to tune from zero to 50 yards with a fixed blade, have a nice heavy 420, 430 grain arrow, good kinetic energy, front and center, I want to have the best odds in my favor for when my five weeks come of the year that if I put a marginal shot on that buck, that that blade is that blade I, I shoot a four blade slick trick that's what mm-hmm. i love to shoot the magnums and and i've seen some major damage on marginal shots breaking bones breaking shoulders i mean granted i know if you shoot a deer in the shoulder in a certain spot i don't care what you shoot you're not gonna you hit that bone you're done right you're not gonna get it. 
you know. Right. But uh, I, in my mind, I just love to tinker. I love to. I'm, I'm a big 3D shooter. I shoot all year long. Uh, I shoot a lot of competitions locally, and uh, I just love to. If I, I I'm going to get that out. If a lot of guys shoot mechanicals because they. They, they don't take the time or don't know how, or they just pick up their ball a week before the season mm-hmm. and start shooting, and, and they shoot perfect with mechanicals because they, they fly like your field tips, which is, right. I you know, I agree with that. I'm good with that. Right. But I'm just a total fixed-blade guy, yeah, without I, a doubt. I used, to, I used to like mechanicals for the purpose of them being, you know, ac- accurate, um, you know, flying like my field tips. And I've yep. changed, actually, you know, recently over the past, I guess, probably year or two to where I... I shoot fixed and it was really, I was listening to a guy talk about, um, he was a well-respected, like he was a bow engineer. I forget who he used to work for, but he used to build, build bows and was a consultant for a bunch of different bow manufacturers on like their different technologies that they were going to be using, like in their cam systems and stuff like that for, you know, all these, you know, it's top bow companies. I want to say he might've worked for Matthews. Maybe I can't remember off the top of my head, but anyway, okay. Yeah, I mean, he was just, I mean, he knew the science behind it and, like, the physics behind it and, like, the, you know, how, like, the mechanics and, like, the math all, like, works and stuff like that. And he basically had a rule of thumb that he was said that, you know, he preferred fixed blades. He said that he certainly prefers, um, he, his wife and his kids, or his son both hunt, and his son was, like, 15 or something like that. And he yeah. said, if you have anything shorter than a 28-inch draw length, I think is what it was. Um, yeah, and I am. I'm, I'm 26. <laughs> yeah, I'm 26 and a half. And he said, if you have yeah. anything left less than a 28 inch draw length, you should never shoot a mechanical because of the amount the amount of kinetic energy you're using for that blade to open is yeah. is really really hurting you. Yeah, um, he's I mean, like, I, I, I've, I've heard stories of deflections and the blades open up, the arrow tumbles all into the woods. Yeah, I've heard horrible stories. Yeah. So, and not saying that that's like a hundred percent, but I just was like, if th- this guy really knows what he's talking about, and he's saying that anyone that has a draw length that's shorter than than that shouldn't because they don't have, for one, they're starting out behind the eight ball because they just don't have the draw length to create the the speed that turns the velocity that turns into kinetic energy. Um, yep. you know, he was like, then you really shouldn't. He's like, and then anyone over that, he was like, then I think you can, he's like, because what you're losing on impact for the blade to open isn't as severe or it's not as, as damaging. He's like, but I still would, you know, recommend a, a fixed blade. Um, so yep. what bow are you shooting, man? Uh, actually I just started shooting for 3d, the Bowtech rain seven. I just got it, just set it up and I shot a, a couple local 3d competition shoots with it. I'm going to go shoot the Massachusetts Reinhardt and Sturbridge with it. And I love it. Probably the, for me, again, it's, you know, every, every bow is a good bow as long as you like it. Mm-hmm. I, I really like it. But for my hunting bow, I actually like messing around with old school bows. Tell you the truth. I have mm-hmm. a, I, I'm, I'm pretty much a Bowtech guy. And my old school bow is a Bowtech Assassin, mm-hmm. and I put Schmitty green strings on it this year, and I have an Axel Carbon Pro one-pin slider on it, QAD rest, and I'm going to get some, some tap bars, titanium archery products, stabilizers. Mm-hmm. I'm yep. going to grab a set of them, put that in. I'm going to start tuning that in the next couple of weeks, get that ready for uh, paper tune it, bear shaft tune it, and get the broadheads going with it. Nice. What uh, yeah. any any particular camo pattern or company you like to like to go with or feel feel comfortable in? Actually, I re- I'm really not a big w- what it looks like camo kind of guy. Mm-hmm. I'm you know I guess your normal real tree camo you mm-hmm. know, but I'm not. Uh, as long as it's scent free and it's in my truck, it's not being in the house or I get changed right on the right where I park my truck and all my truck all my clothes stay in my truck pretty much. But I you know I guess it's like. I have one predator, predator. Mm-hmm. I guess you. I was that predator camo. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I shoot deer in my jeans most of the time. My call heart green jeans. <laughs> right. I know. It's <laughs> with my bu- boots on. You know. <laughs> <laughs> buddy of mine. Uh, you you could sit up there with a red flannel checkered shirt on as long as you're hunting the wind right. They're not gonna you shoot you shoot them all day long. You know. Right. It's a, it's you know my you know our grandparents killed plenty of deer in in red yeah. flannel shirts. You know what I mean? In, in and yeah, work, it, in work it, boots. So so hey man, I got. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. It's funny you say that about the camo. And in, in the beginning of the season, all I wear is green call hard pants. That's it. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I got uh, I got one final question for you, and then I'll go ahead and get you out of here. And this is kind of how I like to wrap up each show. But 
you know, if you wouldn't mind, take us, uh, take us on a hunt with you and tell me, you know, a memorable hunt. It could be one that you harvested or one that you had a close encounter with or one that got away. But if you wouldn't mind, take us along with you. Tell us what state you're hunting, uh, what time of year it is and, uh, give us all the details from the, uh, from the, from the cab of the truck back to the tailgate. No, boy, this is going to be a long one. You sure you're ready for this? Oh, I'm ready, man. I'm ready. I'm settled in. <laughs> I, uh, I mean, I mean, it could be the biggest buck I shot, or I, I, I'm going to tell you the most me- memorable hunt, cherished hunt, and, and I'm pretty sure you saw this on my Instagram feed the other day, is <clears throat> my daughter Sage is 10 years old right now. Three years ago, I have a spot that I hunt in New York and Long Island that I always called it the meat tree. Whenever the wind turns east, I get in this area, and there's a logging road in the middle of the woods. And I've sat in this tree since I was 16, 17 years old. I probably killed 50, 60 deer out of it. So Sage, my daughter, is like my twin. Thank God. You know, and, and, and it's, it's unreal how she wants to follow my footsteps. She's daddy's little girl. She shoots competitions with me. She shed hunts with me. <clears throat> and, and, I, and I'm blessed to have a daughter that really wants to have that relationship with her father. Yeah, for sure. So three years ago, and she's very fidgety, like me. I Like, half the time I can't sit still. I always got to do something. <laughs> so I got to try to figure out a plan to get her to stay calm and cool and let's play this out for these two hours sit, at least get her to sit for two hours so I can try to kill a doe, you know, and, 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 and it's going to be right in front of her. So to make a long story kind of short is I the wind was turning east, and I knew it two days before because the leading front of the edge of a storm was coming. I have a little half a ladder stand that I set up five yards away from this tree that I've been climbing since I was 16, 17 years old out in, in, on this logging road for an east wind. So me and a couple of my friends that I hunt with set up this little ladder stand. It's only like six feet off the ground, and we brushed it all in with mountain laurel so she can get in. It's like her own little fort. Mm-hmm. So as we're doing that, I'll go home that evening knowing two days Two days coming prior, it's going to be an east wind. And I'm really saying, Sage, I got your first tree stand set up. We're going to go to Walmart in the morning. We'll, we'll get you a new camo. You could pick it out. I, like, made it really exciting for her. So she can be like, I can't wait to go. Two more days. So now she's really amped. The tree stand's set up. It's all ready to go. And I, and I said, Sage, you're going to see how Daddy uses his long wolf climber to climb the tree, and it'll be really cool. So that morning comes. We wake up, we go have breakfast. I'm pretty sure it was a Saturday, Saturday or Sunday it was. Mm -hmm. We go to Walmart up the road from my house. She picks out a camel, we get boots. Everything is whatever she wants. So I told her, I said, you know, now it's like 12 o'clock. I said, listen, you want to go to McDonald's? We'll have lunch. Are you kidding me? I'm like, oh, let's go to McDonald's on the way out. And it's probably like a 45, 50 minute drive from my house to where we have to go. So we go have lunch. We we get out. We have lunch. We drive out to the spot. She's in her camo. I'm just in my regular clothes, you know. So we get out there. We we, we park at my uh, at my permission where I have permission to park at this guy's house. And she watches me get dressed outside the truck in my camo. I get my bow ready, and I put my tree stand on my back. And I said, "All right, now listen. We got to walk in really, really quiet, and you got to stay right behind me." And you got to be from now on. You got to be quiet. And she has like a little Game Boy with her. You're mm-hmm. familiar with what the kids play with? Yeah. They can turn the volume off. Yep. So and, and 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 I'll never forget this for the rest of my life. We step into the woods. We're walking through these hills, and and the acorns are falling. The squirrels are going nuts. And I'm looking back at her, and she's like looking up in the trees, and I'm smiling at her. I'm like this, pretty cool, huh? She's like this. Yeah. Where's my tree stand? That's all she wants to know is where her tree stand was. <laughs> Like, where is it? I'm like, all right, relax. Remember, we got to be slow. So now it's like 3 o'clock. It's going to be dark at like 5, 5.30, whatever it is. I'm trying to set it up for a two-hour sit so it just doesn't go bad. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So I'm pretty sure it's like October maybe 10th. Like deer are starting to scrape, you know, little bucks are starting to scrape, and every overhanging branch on the logging road when we got to, to to, to my tree, I looked down the logging road, I'm like, holy crap, there's like seven scrapes right here in front of me. So I get her in her stand. She loves it, loves it. I said, all right, I'm going to climb the tree, and we got to be really, really quiet. We'll do hand signals until dark. So I climb up the tree, and she's looking at me in amazement, like, how the heck are you climbing this tree with this thing and going 25 feet up there, you know? <laughs> so, Clint, check this out. I'm sitting there. Well, it's like an hour, hour and a half. 
I'm looking down at her with thumbs up, and she's playing the game, and she has a face mask on. And I can hear deer in the back where I always hear them get up from their beds and start making their way. So I'm, I'm telling her, I'm like, Sage, I'm putting my finger on my, my I'm like, you got to be quiet. They're coming. With that, remember I told you we brushed the laurels in around the tree stand? Yeah. Three different bucks in a bachelor group walked up this logging road. The buck that I shot got his rack wrapped up in the laurel bush that we went around her stand with, made a scrape, stepped off it. I grunted. I had the pin on him already, and I freaking ripped him. And that deer went like, took like 10 feet back. It looked around and looked right at her and fell over dead. And Sage stood up in the tree stand, raised up her arms like, Daddy, we did it. That's and I'm going to awesome. tell you, and I, don't, and I know everyone's going to hear this, and, and I'm not ashamed of it. I was crying hysterical in my tree. Oh, I, 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 could, I had to hang the ball up and just sit down and put my head in my hands. I'm like, I can't believe this just happened. I can't yep. believe it. Yep. So that that right there, a little a, a little seven pointer, meant the whole world to me as my most cherished hunt with my first time her ever being in the woods, Sage ever, and she loved it. It's pretty yeah. cool. That's amazing. Yeah, that's a that's a great story, and uh, I think a great place to to end. Uh, to end this episode because I don't I don't know that it gets much better than that, that man because that that just kind of encapsulates what uh, what it's all about man I'm 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 happy for you and congratulations yeah, on that deer you know number one but man I'm I'm even more happy for you that that you got to experience that with your with your little girl man that that definitely means the world I've had you know one or two uh, experiences that were similar not quite like that but uh and I I know the I know the feels you get whenever you have those moments so you know good for you yeah. man. Yeah, man. Thank you for the kind words. I appreciate it. Yeah. Well, hey, man, before I let you go, tell people where they can find out a little bit more about you or they can follow you and uh, and, and kind of tag along with you and all your hunting adventures. Well, I'm not on Facebook. I'm pretty much just on Instagram at uh, double lunger, double underscore lunger with four R's on Instagram, pretty much. Yeah. And that's it. Rick awesome. Kiley at du- double lunger. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, everyone out there, give Rick uh, a follow. He's a good follow. Always posting interesting, interesting stuff. And uh, one of my favorite things about it is, is uh, you always get the unfiltered real hunting story. There's no there's no shame in the in the mishaps. It's all part of the all part of the game. And he kind of shares those um, all those journeys, the, the good, the bad, the ugly and the, the in between. And I think that's uh, um, I think that's what's uh, what makes some of the folks that we've been having on the show here uh, recently, you know, unique. And uh, I think uh, the authenticity shines through. And I think appreciate people uh, appreciate it. And I definitely appreciate you making time to come on the show. So I, I appreciate it, man. Yep, I appreciate it. And thank you for the kind words, sir. All right, folks, that is a wrap for today's show. I want to thank Rick for joining and be sure to give Rick a follow on Instagram. You'll be able to find a link to his Instagram page in the blog post show notes. Also, I want to thank all of you for tuning in and giving me part of your day. Uh, And be sure to hit the iTunes subscribe button so you don't miss any of the upcoming episodes. And follow along with us uh, on the Truth From The Stand Facebook and Instagram pages. And if you'd like to get involved in the show or uh, have us or a guest answer your questions, or if you'd just like to recommend a topic for discussion, email me your suggestion at truthfromthestand at gmail.com or click the email button on our Instagram account and leave us a message. And finally, I want to give a big shout out to our partners that continue to help us make this podcast possible. Whitetail Institute of North America, Exodus Outdoor Gear, and Lone Wolf Portable Tree Stands. Until next time, we'll see y'all. Long time coming if it all It takes a special knowing to call a fall Damaged heads, broken letters Nationalize yourself in numbers But I can't